Hi, I'm Amanda Ogburn. Today, people who have spent time and money on educating themselves are known for making their communities and nations a better place to live. Those who teach are held in even higher esteem for spending their lives imparting their knowledge and wisdom. For some parents, a college degree is often required before you can quarter date their child. These seem to be standard thoughts in most industrialized nations. However, education was once considered a privilege and standard available mostly to the affluent or particularly gifted. Education was the foundation to be considered as an accomplished gentleman. Students of the past in China, Timbuktu, and Paris were held to much higher standards than the students of today, and I believe this caused them to achieve a greater number of accomplishments than we see today. Though each country differed on what they believed to be the most important about education, they all agreed that the expectations for a well-educated man pointed to a life of consistent study, respectful inquiries, and humble reflection. I will explain my way of thinking by reviewing the common standards that these epicenters of learning expected from their students. With each standard, I will provide examples from old texts that were for the students' edification. I will also discuss life after university and the foundation of character that these students were expected to have. Throughout this presentation, I want you to challenge yourself. Could you have obtained your bachelor's or master's degree in this environment? One of the standards for these original students was the expectation to conduct themselves with uncompromising propriety. Shang Duan Li's A Schedule for Learning is one of the most comprehensive texts we have on early Chinese education. In it, Chang details every part of his student's life from the proper way to walk in the halls to the correct way to play an instrument for recreational purposes. Most importantly, he explicitly describes the proper way to order your day as a student to obtain the optimal level of study. His purpose in providing such a strict schedule was to combine the mind and reason of all students. Chang states, for it is the purpose of this work to differentiate between the essential and the trivial, and to retain a proper order of progress. Robert de Sorbonne's regulations for his college details the life and regulations for the students of Paris. Similar to the students of China, Parisian students had most of their life at the school dictated for them too. Robert de Sorbonne went so far as to detail what kind of visitors the students could have and when they could eat in their private rooms. This last point was to protect the quiet study time that other students may be having in the rooms next door. Ahmad Baba's description of Muhammad Bahayago takes a different route. Ahmad takes great care to detail Muhammad's attributes and character. Muhammad was humble, patient, trustworthy, and continued to learn well into his elderly years. Ahmad was particularly struck by Muhammad's unwavering kindness and generosity. Though Ahmad does not state it in the text, it is clear that he holds Muhammad as a model for students to respect and emulate. The second standard for these students was to maintain and encourage an earnest thirst for knowledge and a diligent application to their studies. Articles of the White Deer Grotto Academy is Zhu Si's compilation of the teachings of Confucius that he believed were the most important for students to grasp. In ancient China, what began as the noble pursuit of studying had transformed into the selfish desire to promote and advance oneself in the way of politics. Men did this mostly by regurgitating information and copying the thought process of previous masters. Zhu Xi, like Confucius, was convinced that the true purpose of study was reflection. To obtain this, you had to seek and constantly review knowledge. For example, Zhu Xi claims as to the proper procedure for study, there are also five items as follows. Study extensively, inquire carefully, ponder thoroughly, sift clearly, and practice earnestly. Additionally, in his proposals for schools and officials recruitment, Zhu Xi discusses the importance of studying for the information rather than for personal gain. He encouraged the school system to change by enforcing certain regulations on testing that would require the students to express their own thoughts. In Paris, rules for licensing a student to teach describes the rigorous periods of study that men had to endure before they were allowed to lecture. Just to obtain a bachelor's degree in medicine, students had to attend masses, answer a certain number of questions, and attend a certain amount of lectures. For example, it is written in the licensing rules. Also, they shall assure the dean, or before the whole faculty, that they have attended lectures in medicine for three years and are in their fourth year, which they've attended five months. I often hear students today complaining about the amount of work they're given. I wonder how they would feel about that course load. 
A well-educated man was expected to continue his studies throughout his life, and therefore did not stop learning or studying once he left university. In Timbuktu, students read about Ahmad Altin Bukti. Ahmad Baba, in addition to writing about Muhammad Bahayago, brought us the works of Altin Bukti. Altin Bukti was known for being a renowned teacher of many subjects, including law and science. Ahmad stated he was a jurist, a lexicologist, a grammarian, a prosodist, and a man who avidly sought after knowledge his whole life, being the owner of many books which he had copied in his own hand and annotated. When describing Muhammad, Ahmad Baba discusses that continuing education was a righteous pursuit for a holy man. He, Muhammad, and Ahmad al Tanbukti all believed that learning was an avenue of worship. Jussi believed that continuing and constant education was the way to maintain just officers in the government. In essence, if the system of education was changed to benefit those with good character, it would force those of selfish attitude out. In proposals for schools and official recruitment, he called for certain elements of the examination to be disbanded and called for moral conduct to be placed in larger focus. Each student was also expected to make respectful inquiries of information instead of receiving ideas at face value. Where most of today's schooling is focused on parroting back answers, the original students were expected to ask questions of their teachers and professors. They were also expected to challenge ideas and concepts as well as attend debates between their teachers. Taking an essay or a theory without first questioning its truth or possible flaws was considered foolish. In Jussi's article of the White Deer Grotto Academy, previously quoted, three of the five points for learning are centered on discernment and deduction. Robert Croissant's Statutes for the University of Paris specifically require students to attend debates of their masters. This was to encourage them to ask questions and delve deeper into a practical knowledge of their subjects. Ahmad Baba's description of Muhammad Bahiago describes a scenario in which Muhammad was tested by a student with new information. Instead of shaming or ignoring that student, Muhammad would listen. Uh, Ahmed Baba also wrote, I drew his attention to one of my writings, and he was pleased with it, and wrote praise of it in his own hand. Indeed, he wrote down portions of my scholarly research, and I heard him quoting it in some of his classes, for he was fair-minded and humble, and ready to accept the truth from wherever it came. Lastly, each student is expected to humbly reflect upon himself and his achievements, to determine if there is anything further he can do to improve humanity around him. Simply improving yourself was not enough for these ancient masters. To become a well-rounded and accomplished student, one must also be humble and helpful. Chang Duan Li's A Schedule for Learning holds his fellow teachers to this high standard. He claims that Confucius started with ensuring his students understood true humanity before they began to study anything else, and they must also do the same. Ahmad Baba also provides great detail of, hum of Muhammad's humility in the description of Muhammad Bahayago. For example, with all this, he was constant in his devotions, shunning immorality, thinking well of all mankind, even oppressors, minding his own business, and eschewing curiosity over what was not his concern. However, the act of being humble or understanding humanity was merely the first step. Students also had to show kindness to those below them in station and assist the poor. In Robert Croissant's Statutes for the University of Paris, the rules of the school dictated what type of clothing the students should wear and that the remainder of their clothes should be given as donations to the poor. Can you imagine showing up at your dorm and donating almost all of the clothes you brought with you? In conclusion, our predecessors were expect expected to study diligently, quietly, and for many years before they could even obtain a status or degree. Their studies were continuous, even after they left university. While some positions required this constant study, most students just did so because they believed a righteous and well-educated man should. This way of life led these societies to many new theories in philosophy, science, medicine, art, music, and law. These men, however, did not hold their inventions or advancements as riches to be won or renowned to be gained. Each of their cultures placed a value on serving others with patience and joy because this is what a good, educated man does. Due to that background and their humility, they wanted to share their developments with the world. We as the human race are better because of them. Which begs the question, if we all studied in the same fashion, what could we give to the world? 
Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed.